Welcome to the latest in our Friday Soundbite series uh, that I've entitled Walking in the Ways of God. Uh, our reading for today is Revelation chapter 8. Uh, so I'm going to read from that chapter for us. So Revelation chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer, with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. As I say, we're continuing our Friday Soundbite series this morning uh, uh, by beginning to look at some of the spiritual disciplines given to us by God to help us grow in the spiritual life, to help us grow in our ability to walk in the ways of God. And so this morning uh, we begin that by looking at the whole issue of prayer. Now, if I remember correctly, I think it was about 1980 when Channel 4 began broadcasting. A, a new channel for a new age was proclaimed, uh, full of very cutting edge and taboo subjects that none of the other channels would touch at the time. Which of course makes it a bit ironic to think that the only programme that has survived on Channel 4 from that day to this is Countdown. Very cutting edge, but anyway. Now I can't remember watching much Channel 4 in those early days, but one thing that did catch my imagination was the American football. It seemed all very weird and exotic. Men who were invariably seven foot tall and seven foot wide, with another foot of armour plating, some of whom never touched the ball in a game, and whose sole job it was to knock the opponents to the floor. Not everyone's cup of tea, I grant you, but I became a very big Washington Redskins fan, them being the team to beat at the time. I mention all of this because American football is the only game that I can think of that is a part of the game that refers specifically to prayer. It comes right at the end of what needs to be a very close game. One team is usually losing by just a few points and running out of time to score the points it needs to win. So the quarterback, the guy who throws the ball, instead of trying to throw the ball to a particular individual, as he does for the rest of the game, gets his entire team to run forward and then throws it high into the air in a last desperate attempt to get the points his team needs to win. And this pass has a name. It's the Hail Mary pass. Hail Mary, of course, being the first phrase of the Roman Catholic prayer. That is the only deliberate reference in the whole of sport to prayer that I can think of, and its use is actually quite instructive, I think. Why is it called the Hail Mary pass? Because it is the last play of the game. When all else has failed, it is a last act of desperation. For the rest of the game, the team has had a game plan. It has depended on its own resources, its tactics and team members to get the job done. But when all else fails, when all human strength and ingenuity has failed them, when all other options have deserted them, then, and only then, do they throw up a prayer, a pass with a prayer attached. The ball, the ball goes high into the air, hangs for an age, giving the other team members as much time as possible to get into a scoring position. And as it does, the prayers of the fans go up, Oh Lord, may it land in our hands, may it land in our hands. Desperate people pray. Is that not the almost universal view of prayer? People in terrible situations, people without hope, people fearing the worst, pray. Of course, that's not necessarily all bad. For some, praying in times of real desperation has led to a very real kickstart in their spiritual life. But for many, maybe even many of us, we only really pray fervently and earnestly when we're in times of crisis or pain. Whereas the rest of the time, we are apt to rely on our own strength and ingenuity. Why is it, do you think, that for most of us, 
whilst we're able to do something actively about a situation, we then find it so hard to find time in our busy lives to pray about these things. Indeed, why did I just make the comparison between doing and praying as if praying isn't doing something? Is it because deep down we're often greatly troubled by thoughts of the futility of it all? One writer has put it this way, the idea that everything would happen exactly as it does, regardless of whether we pray or not, is a spectre that haunts the mind of many who sincerely profess belief in God. Of course, that's not how the Bible views prayer. We know that. I could give many examples of people in the Bible praying to God and changing things dramatically, but I'm not sure how much all that would help us. For most of us, it wouldn't tell us anything we don't already know. In the Bible, prayer works. In our lives, we're not so sure. So what can I do to encourage us to take a renewed look at prayer? Well, let's begin by turning back to our reading to Revelation chapter 8. In the previous chapters, 4-7, to seven, John has described heaven as a place of eternal worship and glory and praise to God Almighty, multitudes upon multitudes proclaiming the majesty of the Lord. And then, something remarkable happens. He tells us in verse 1 that when he opened the seventh seal, that is the Lamb, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And during this time, we're told, another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. And following this, of course, come great acts of judgment upon the earth. But what is striking about it is that it all happens in response to the prayers of the saints. So usually I, I think we tend to think of events on earth being interrupted because of actions taken in heaven. However, here we're told that it's the other way round. All of heaven comes to a standstill. The endless songs and praises of the heavenly multitudes suddenly stop. Why? Because people are praying. All of heaven stops. So that the prayers of God's people, the likes of you and me, can rise before the throne of God. They are heard. They matter that much. Our prayers, yours and mine, interrupt the worship of heaven. I mean, that is an image that is very hard to get your head around. One writer puts it this way. History, John tells us, belongs to the intercessors, those who believe and pray the future into being. History does not belong to the powerful or the wealthy or the rulers or the armies or the corporations or the global media empires. What they do on their own, apart from God, may look impressive for a while, but the time will come when all merely human actions will be tossed forgotten on the ash heap of the dead past. But prayer changes things forever. Now that all sounds rather grand, and maybe it should. If you think about it, if there is any truth in prayer, then what is happening when we pray is that we are speaking to the Lord God Almighty, the creator of all that was and is and is to come. When it comes to terms like grand and important, can any of us think of many things more grand and more important in our lives in this world than that? We'll come back next week and ponder some more the place of prayer in the walk of faith. But for now, I want to dare to leave you some homework. It's not very much, I promise. Uh, on the screen, uh, I've put some verses. Uh, maybe you could pause the video for a moment and write them down, or, or come back to them later. Then what I would like you to do is to take one verse each day for the next week, and just spend some time thinking about it, dwelling on it, pondering it. You may want to reflect on that verse for a while that day. You may want to learn the verse off by heart. It's entirely up to you what you do with it. But I would like you to spend some time in what the scripture says about prayer each day this week. And then next week, we'll come back and think about the topic some more. But having uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking about prayer, maybe we really ought to pray. So let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the fact that often 
prayer is not held in our hearts or, and in our lives as import, as important as it is in your word. Maybe because, Heavenly Father, actually we just don't have that same vision for prayer that you have. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we continue to ponder that wonderful vision from Revelation chapter 8, and as we ponder the verses that we're going to be reading over the next week, that through that we may begin once again to claim a vision of prayer that you would have us see. May it change our hearts forever. To your honour and glory we pray. Amen. And so to end our soundbite, we're going to have a song, as we usually do, uh, a song this week that speaks to the fact that when we pray, we pray to a God who is able to give us and bless us so much. Mm -hmm. 